Lumberjacks get a win and a loss over the weekend. Dan Kearns, The Standard. Scugog. The Port Perry Lumberjacks had mixed results over the weekend, losing to the Uxbridge Bruins but defeating the North Kawartha Knights. The Lumberjacks opened their weekend action on Friday, September 29th in Uxbridge in the first Battle of North Durham of the season. A little over three and a half minutes into the first period, the Bruins found the back of the net to take an early 1-0 lead. However, with only two minutes left on the clock in the period, Braden Vanetten scored, tying the game 1-1. Six and a half minutes into the second period, despite making a desperate dive to try and stop the puck, the Bruins put the puck past goaltender Van Kulba to restore the one-goal deficit. Then, nearly 16 minutes into the frame, the Bruins would score a shorthanded goal, making it a 3-1 game. However, late in the period, Andrew Nicardo Soul banged in a puck in the side of the Bruins' net, cutting the deficit to 3-2. Both teams would trade goals in the third period, and the Bruins won the game by a score of 4-3. The Lumberjacks' third period goal was scored by Kyle Bailey. The Lumberjacks got a better result when they faced the North Kawartha Knights at Scugog Arena on Sunday, October 1st. Twelve minutes into the first period, Cole Papagiorgio capitalized on a Lumberjacks power play to make it a 1-0 game. A little over three and a half minutes later, Johannes Kamm scored his first goal as a Lumberjack, extending the lead to 2-0. The Knights would score the only goal of the second period, so the game had a 2-1 score after 40 minutes of play. A little over three minutes into the third period, Mark Stoop scored his first goal of the season. About a minute later, Parker LeMay put the puck in the net, making it a 4-1 game. A minute after that goal, Kyle Jessam also put the puck in the net. The Knights would score twice later in the period, but the Lumberjacks held on to win the game 5-3. One-timers. The Lumberjacks have a busy week ahead. This Thursday, October 5th, they will travel to the Garnet B. Rickard Complex in Clarington to play against the Eagles. That game begins at 7.25 p.m. On Saturday, October 7th, the Lumberjacks will travel to North Kawartha for a game against the Knights. That game will start at 7.25 p.m. On Sunday, October 8th, the Lumberjacks host the Uxbridge Bruins at Scugog Arena. In a pre-Thanksgiving matchup, that game begins at 2.25 p.m. Uxbridge Legion, hosting Remembrance Speaker Series, Daryl Knight, The Standard. Uxbridge. Later this month, Uxbridge Branch 170 of the Royal Canadian Legion will be hosting a trio of special guests as part of the Remembrance Speaker Series. Each event will take place at the Legion, located at 109 Franklin Street, beginning at 7 p.m., with a $10 admission fee per event. Additional donations will be accepted appreciatively. In addition, there will be books for sale to further the educational experience leading up to Remembrance Day in November. The series starts on Thursday, October 19th, with one of Uxbridge's most renowned authors, Ted Barris, presenting on The Battle of the Atlantic, Gauntlet to Victory. The noted historian will be highlighting the longest continuous action of World War II, the pivotal battle of the Atlantic. On Sunday, October 22nd, the Legion will welcome author and broadcaster Andy Robert Shaw. One of the UK's most exciting military historians, his experiential approach draws upon years of experience in archaeological research. He will be presenting on Finding the Fallen, the Archaeology of the Great War. Finally, the series comes to a close on Thursday, October 26th, in an informative evening with broadcaster and author Malcolm Kelly, who will be presenting work related to her latest book, Sprague, a novel of Bomber Command. His work traces the story of the young men who flocked to Canada from across the Commonwealth, the United Kingdom, and the USA in hopes of conquering the challenges of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Welcome to You've Got to Be Kidding! podcast that offers a different perspective of life around us. Listen now to author Jonathan Van Bilsen. You may have read the news this week. The National Museum of Scotland is repatriating a looted totem pole belonging to the Nisgaa Nation of British Columbia. The memorial pole was stolen by Marius Barbeau, an anthropologist, in 1929. He removed the 11-meter red cedar pole, which was hand-carved in the 1860s, and sold it to the Scottish Museum. I've witnessed stolen artifacts in museums all over the world. 259 items looted from Troy, often referred to as Trojan gold, have been held in the Pushkin Museum in Moscow since 1945. American archaeologist Hiram Bingham 
The first Westerner to find Machu Picchu sold thousands of priceless objects he found to Yale University. Even the beard which supports the head of Egypt's Sphinx sits in the British Museum in London. It has always been stated by looters, no doubt, these items should be in large museums for us to see. Besides, many countries of origin cannot properly care for them. That, however, is no longer the case. There is a growing debate in the global community surrounding the repatriation of artifacts that have been stolen from archaeological sites. Many argue these treasures should be returned to their countries of origin, while others believe they should remain in museums and collections around the world. While the issue is multifaceted, there are compelling reasons why stolen artifacts should be repatriated. First and foremost, the historic and cultural value of the artifacts to their countries of origin cannot be overstated. Artifacts are not merely objects, they're integral parts of a nation's history, identity and heritage. They provide a tangible connection to ancient civilizations and their achievements. Repatriating stolen artifacts is a way to rectify past injustices and restore a sense of national pride and identity. Moreover, repatriation can contribute to the preservation and protection of these artifacts. Many countries lack the resources and expertise to adequately care for their archaeological treasures. By returning stolen artifacts, wealthier nations with advanced conservation techniques should assist in their preservation. This ensures their long-term survival, preventing further deterioration or destruction. Additionally, the ethical implications of holding stolen artifacts cannot be disregarded. Most of these items were illicitly obtained, often through looting and illegal excavations. By allowing these treasures to remain in museums and in private collections, we risk promoting the perpetuating the We risk promoting and perpetuating the black market trade. Many nations have endured a long history of colonization and exploitation, often resulting in the pillaging of their cultural treasures. Returning stolen artifacts is an important step toward acknowledging the past wrongdoings and promoting dialogue and understanding between nations. Lastly, the educational and economic benefits of repatriation cannot be overlooked. Returning stolen artifacts provides an opportunity for local communities to engage with their own history, as well as generate tourism and economic opportunities. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen, and this is You've Got to Be Kidding. City of Kawartha Lakes adopts province's housing target. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Kawartha Lakes. The City of Kawartha Lakes has accepted the Ontario Provincial Government's housing creation target and is expected to respond to the province by the imposed deadline. In August, the Provincial Government announced they were launching what is known as the Building Faster Fund and created housing targets for a number of municipalities. Kawartha Lakes' housing target is 6,500 new homes by 2031. The Building Faster Fund will provide $400 million in new annual funding for three years to municipalities which are on target to meet provincial housing targets by 2031. Municipalities that reach 80% of their annual target each year will become eligible for funding based on their share of the overall goal of 1.5 million homes. Municipalities that exceed their target will receive a bonus on top of their allocation, a provincial press release explained. The municipalities which agree to the provincial housing targets will receive what the province calls strong mayor powers. At a meeting on Tuesday, September 26th, Kawartha Lakes councillors agreed this funding opportunity is too great to pass up. It's getting to the end game, and the end game is we have to endorse and follow that 6,500 so we're eligible for that funding which is out there. And we need to have that funding, so for me, this is the step we need to take, Ward 8 Councillor and Deputy Mayor Tracy Richardson said. Ward 2 Councillor Pat Warren said she was in favour of supporting this target because we do need the funding. At a council meeting on Tuesday, August 29th, Mayor Doug Elmsley explained what strong mayor powers are. Strong mayor powers and duties include choosing to appoint the municipality's chief administrative officer, hiring certain municipal department heads, and establishing and reorganizing departments, creating committees of council, assigning their functions, and appointing the chair and vice chairs, proposing the municipal budget, which would be subject to council amendments, vetoing certain bylaws if the head of council is of the opinion that all or part of the bylaw could potentially interfere with the provincial priority 
in bringing forward matters of council consideration if the head of council is of the opinion that considering the manor could advance a provincial priority. But, at the September meeting, Mayor Elmsley reiterated comments he made in August about the likelihood of him using any of these powers. We have always acted in a collaborative manner. We have always acted in accordance with democratic procedures, in that we consult with the council on how we do things, he said. As I've said to you before, and as I've said to the press, we do not envision a time when I would use strong mayor powers. Ward 4 Councillor Dan Joyce commented that while this council trusts Mayor Elmsley, he doesn't know how future elected mayors would handle these powers. We have a strong democracy, with guardrails. The guardrails are important, he said. Mayor Elmsley responded, pointing out council can overturn any decision a mayor makes with the strong mayor powers with a two-thirds majority vote. There are checks and balances in there, he said. The motion to support the housing target was passed unanimously. The city has until October 15th to respond in writing to the provincial government. New Electric Ice Resurfacer for Brock Township. Daryl Knight, The Standard. Brock. As part of the township's ongoing efforts to reduce carbon emissions and improve experiences for residents and visitors alike, Brock recently unveiled a new electric ice resurfacing machine which will be patrolling the ice at Foster Hewitt Memorial Arena in Beaverton this season. In a press release, the municipality noted, shifting away from the traditional propane-powered machine to an electric version was driven by a desire to reduce air and noise pollution, enhance energy efficiency, and improve the overall ice maintenance process at their facilities. By embracing new, innovative technologies, it is expected the township will be able to recoup expenses through long-term savings on fuel and maintenance. Brock is committed to improving our impact on the environment. This council takes its commitment to dealing with climate change seriously, and we are very proud to get our electric fleet started with the replacement of one of our ice resurfacers, commented Mayor Walter Schumer. This new ice resurfacer will not only improve our township's carbon footprint, but will make our arena environments better for our residents, participants, and staff. We want to thank our staff for the excellent work they have done in making this step toward a better environment in Brock a reality. Looking further into the future, Regional Councillor Mike Jubb observed, this move toward an electric fleet is still in its infancy, and there are many opportunities for the township to utilize technology to lessen the impact on the environment. In late 2021, Brock officially declared a climate emergency. Following this, Council and staff are looking at every initiative or report through a climate lens. I am extremely happy we are putting words to action, added Councillor Jubb. Brock's first electric Zamboni purchase is our largest initiative thus far. This, combined with smaller initiatives such as automatic water filling stations, electric power tools to maintain grass, and no mow may, are all initiatives working toward making Brock green. I look forward to further initiatives in the future which continue to support our climate emergency declaration. The township noted the new ice resurfacer uses advanced lithium-ion batteries, which require minimal charging time and will be nearly silent when in operation, allowing for a more serene environment at local rinks while also knowing they are aiding the environment. Brock's new electric ice resurfacing machine means zero tailpipe emissions in the arena and no need to purchase propane. This is a great step toward the carbon-free future we need to achieve. Ultimately, the entire fleet of vehicles in the township will be electric, added Ward 4 Councillor Kriya Pettingill. Thanksgiving. I am thankful for this gracious move among Indigenous peoples as of late. My wife and I attended a recent Truth and Reconciliation ceremony. Many others shared in the experience with us. It was a straightforward, heartfelt, and informative ceremony. There were words and songs of openness shared by those leading the time of fellowship. The needful perspective changes for Indigenous peoples to live a life of dignity and equality amidst the rest of North America's Turtle Islands peoples were represented graciously. Stories such as the origin of the orange shirt and its significance were shared. The perspective I get when I talk to some out there is there is a demand being made and a pressure to comply being forced around truth and reconciliation. They feel this pressure and are getting resentful. Even if there are some who are actually feeling a surge of control over a society which they as a people and as individuals felt powerless within, this is understandable. 
Don't all of us feel the same sometimes, albeit still to a lesser degree, around other issues and government? Yet this does not mean this is the nature of what is occurring in the hearts of indigenous people here, by majority. So it must be seen for what it is intended, an honest effort to bring a blessing and harmony to our common home. Think of it. This resentful attitude mirrors the one harbored by disgruntled individuals toward caretakers over the children in the residential school system, RSS. So where does cursing our brothers and sisters stop? Let's examine the possible flow of this history and where it could go, if this were true, if truth and reconciliation were not understood and adopted as a conviction. Here's the scenario. The understanding is, some in the RSS harmed others directly, and the system harmed Indigenous identity. So those harmed, or related to them, harm back. This would be natural if they were retaliating against the same ones who did the harm. However, since the last of the residential schools were finally shut down in the 1990s, what remains is the sad neglect of a wounded people and a knee-jerk reaction on both sides left unaddressed, and a new response needed to be taught. Physics says, Nature abhors a vacuum, and without guidance and cooperation, it will rush, in an emotional sense, to fill the void with what is easiest, what is base, and what is already practiced in undeveloped disciplines. This always leads to harm again. It's interesting how the mirror itself is not observed in the tit-for-tat response of history. So then, harmed people harm the ones who were not the ones who committed the original acts, those in the neglectful void of history get defensive or impatient, and can act defensively, with a kind of preemptive strike, from an emotional trigger. This is what prejudice comes from. All it takes is some, not even a majority, to be perceived as expressing a group conviction, and it's on the roll again. We must stop, stop, stop. Instead of from an approach of injustice, the focus in this truth and reconciliation time was on honoring the sense of a young woman's family connection. Her desire to simply express her love for her own grandmother was the focus. A comment on the importance for all of us to value our grandmothers was expressed here. I couldn't help but notice there was a concern for the hearts of all of us, since we all deal with the need of facing and embracing the truth about life. Next, a story was shared about stones on the shore of Lake Ontario. In the story, these stones were anthropomorphized, so as to be conscious entities which had waited patiently for eons for an appointed time. In this, a vivid illustration was brought forth of patience and purpose, preordained by our creative God. The idea was to instill in each of us an awareness, one of purpose and timing in all things. Not our own inventions of purpose, but acceptance of God's purposes, the very reasons our lives are shaped the way they are. Even though we have difficulty understanding the way God does things, we must continue to allow him to navigate from his higher purposes. It is this mistake of letting go of God which causes the drift into despair, grief, bitterness, and even the impatience which often cultivates violence. This is not his way, and so not the design of life. This movement, if embraced in the spirit in which it is intended, is an effort to return our focus and lives to the one who created us. After all, his very nature is the impartation of life, of peace, of love, and inner and relational harmony. In the past, under a repressive religious structure, there were those who outrageously misrepresented the heart of Christ, who is God, our Creator, who came in the form of humanity. They acted out in unthinkable ways, bringing harm to the lives of so many entrusted to them. Yet, as one of the leaders in the Truth and Reconciliation gathering said, patience is a function of trust trusting our God the Creator for His right time and right way of things. We must remember there were some good experiences in the residential schools, but those were few, mutually, among people of dignity. My own grandmother shared with me of her experiences at residential school. She said she had an amazing experience part of the time, as she was taught and cared for by a certain wonderful Christian woman. She did admit there were those who named that name, and others who did not, who were not safe, as she put it. When a system gets too big and rejects oversight, particularly that of God's great spirit, evil and ill will flourish. Additionally, an emphasis was placed, deliberately, 
upon the need for truth to be a way of life. It is a mechanism of reconciliation and a must for all relationships. It was held out as a dimension for everyone to consider, if we are to flourish in any society in our life with anyone. I could not help but recognize the need for this to exist as a tenet to govern our inner life, our spiritual life, as well. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18-19, And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's trespasses against them, and he has given us the message of reconciliation. That's in the New English translation, N-E-T. In the gathering, it was clear an intention to live forward, in the best of lights, was the paramount desire. Young and old people milled about, asking questions, sharing stories, and reconnecting with those not seen in a while. Some even discovered relatives they had never knew they had. My own aunt, whom I had not seen for a few decades, was there. No shot intended, life just gets away from you sometimes. We had a warm time of reconnecting and catching up. Another person shared about a piece of property, which at one time had been a special hunting place for the Ojibwe. It was a place where, by the use of encircling with controlled fire, they would drive their quarry and cull them for food. It became a place of reverence, as did the fire in this respect. Yet over time, Westerners, known as colonizers, built Boyd Mansion, and eventually a school. This was intended to help, but was without the sensibilities to what the indigenous people would want. Eventually this mansion burned down. Ultimately, everything was destroyed. Interesting. Fire in a destructive way. Huh. Yet today there is a proposal to build an indigenous cultural center there, one which can educate everyone of indigenous history, these events, and the hopes of the future. In James chapter 3, verses 5 to 16, too long to write out here, so I recommend you look in your own Bible, or borrow one and read it for yourself, it talks about fire's unruly character. It is similar to our own attitudes, if not checked by God's help. It also addresses how water with impurities cannot bring health, but purity and singleness of purpose, only found in God's Spirit, like flowing clean water, gives life to all who will drink of it. In the residential school system, there were many who operated entirely opposite to God's design, and so against the good for life, wounding the heart of a people. They also did not see how they wounded everyone else's heart in the process. There will be a time when we can say, there are no victims left, only those who are getting stronger, healthier, and more forgiving in the process. This is truth and reconciliation. It is amazing to see the response from lives who have waited in patient endurance, like those stones being buffeted and shaped by the work of time, to rise and assert the wise purpose of healing and forgiveness as the nature of that in this time. I am thankful for this correction in our society, the patient way indigenous cultural leaders are leading the next generations into peace and for those who embrace them. In it all, I am thankful for God, our Creator, who gave of Himself, for not only reconciliation to each other, but to Himself, and for all who will accept the gift of His Son. Happy Thanksgiving season. You've Got to Be Kidding was presented by X4 Media with permission from the Standard Media Group. We endeavor to make all information contained in this program as accurate as possible at production time. X4 Media and the Standard Media Group are not responsible for any liabilities resulting from information contained in this program. For more information, please visit x4media.ca. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for The Standard Newspaper.